Lucretius basically came up with, or didn't come up with, kind of like figured out the whole theory of Darwinism before Darwin with the theory of survival of the fittest. It's on um, lines 850, 855 or so. Yeah, yeah. At that time, too, many species of animals must have perished and failed to propagate and perpetuate their race for every species that you see breathing. The breath of life has been protected and preserved from the beginning of its existence, either by cunning or by courage or by speed. So speed. Please keep going. Oh. Um, there are also many that survive because of their utility, has commended them to our care and committed them to our guardianship. Okay, and then read from 871 and following. But those animals, but those are animals that nature endowed with none of these qualities so that they were unable either to be self-supporting or to render us any useful service in return for which we might allow their kind to have sustenance and security under our protection were, of course, an easy prey and prize for others, shackled as they all were by the, bond, by the bonds of their own destiny until nature brought their species to the sea. Okay. Now, um, I'm, just gonna, I'm just going to make more precise and clear the comment he made. So, you said this, um, this is really striking how this seems to anticipate Darwinism. Okay. But the problem is Darwinism means a lot of different things. And this passage doesn't capture all of them. So which aspects of Darwinian theory of evolution does this capture? And which parts does it not? Um, the things I feel like it captures is the theory of survival of the fittest mm -hmm. and domestication how humans, some animals that in the wild would not survive because of their own nature, they have survived because of our intervention. Okay, so that is a distinction that Darwin makes in the first chapter of Origin of the Species between artificial selection and natural selection. Artificial selection is like, I'm choosing the, a pig that has these qualities or a cow that has these qualities, and I'm propagating future I'm propagating descendants of that according to those qualities I want to preserve. So there's a mind there that's influencing what qualities. If you're if you're choosing it for a big cow, then you're mating big cows with big cows, and then their descendants end up bigger, and you keep doing that, and then you'll end up with bigger and bigger ones, right? Okay, that's called artificial selection, and it's important to distinguish between that and natural selection, where some sort of similar process is happening but not because a mind like a farmer or a husbandman or a stockman or whatever is making the selections. So artificial selection and natural selection, that distinction is present here. You're right, in, in an incredibly vivid way. And this goes way beyond Aristotle, who doesn't make this distinction, and so on. Okay, now you called it survival of the fittest. What, and... So that, that's actually a principle of natural selection, and how that works is by a theory of extinctions. Some animals that aren't fit don't survive and therefore don't propagate their genetics into the next uh, generation. Um, and so it also recognizes the phenomenon of extinction. Okay, which again, Aristotle does, Aristotle, for example, and Aristotle's biology was influential a lot longer than Lucretius, you know, into basically 17th century biology or something. And the idea is that animal species are eternal, and they'll always be created. And the people didn't realize that species can go extinct. In fact, it's very, very recently that we've realized that species can go extinct and that we've actually driven hundreds of millions of them into extinction, and we've now got a new ecological epoch here based on how many species we're driving into extinction. A bunch of them went extinct when this, when this uh, asteroid hit Earth and the dinosaurs went extinct. We're the asteroid now hitting the Earth, driving as many or more species into extinction now. So that's another momentous thing for him to recognize. Now, what of evolutionary theory is not here? 
is not yet present here. I don't think he goes on to like make any claims that species will like evolve into different species over time and that they that they'll because of survival of the fist, I don't think he goes that far. But that the reason why certain animals exist in his time today was that they were able to survive and I don't think he necessarily means that those species came from prior species. Yes, so that's the crucial point, is that he does not have a concept of one species mutating or, as, as, as we say, evolving into another species. So we have to recognize that all of the animals that we see on Earth, including human beings, are the result of mutants. <laughs> Mutations is what has created us, not propagation of the same exact form. We are all mutants, is why we've been able to survive. Otherwise, we'd look like things did in, in prehistoric uh, time. And he does not, there is no evidence in here that he has a view that one kind of animal can change into another kind of animal. And that is a radical view of the origin of species that Darwin says, in fact, so insightful that he says it all comes from the same the same beginning of life like one beginning of life and then it's just a set of mutations and we aren't perfect copies we aren't the perfect copies that have managed to survive